Aesop's Fables The Wolf and the Crane A wolf had been feasting too greedily, and a bone had stuck crosswise in his throat. He could get it neither up nor down, and of course he could not eat a thing. Naturally, that was an awful state of affairs for a greedy wolf. So away he hurried to the crane. He was sure that she, with her long neck and bill, would easily be able to reach the bone and pull it out. I will reward you very handsomely, said the wolf, if you pull that bone out for me. The crane, as you can imagine, was very uneasy about putting her head in a wolf's throat. But she was grasping in nature, so she did what the wolf asked her to do. When the wolf felt that the bone was gone, he started to walk away. Well, what about my reward? called the crane anxiously. What? snarled the wolf, whirling around. Haven't you got it? Isn't it enough that I let you take your head out of my mouth without snapping it off? Moral. Expect no reward for serving the wicked. The Plain Tree Two travelers walking in the noonday sun sought the shade of a wide-spreading tree to rest. As they lay looking up among the pleasant leaves, they saw that it was a plain tree. How useless is the plain, said one of them. It bears no fruit whatever and only serves to litter the ground with leaves. Ungrateful creatures, said a voice from the plain tree. You lie here in my cooling shade, and yet you say I am useless. Thus, ungratefully, O Jupiter, do men receive their blessings. Moral. Our best blessings are often the least appreciated. The Owl and the Grasshopper The owl always takes her sleep during the day. Then after sundown, when the rosy light fades from the sky and the shadows rise slowly through the wood, out she comes ruffling and blinking from the old hollow tree. Now her weird hoo 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 echoes through the quiet wood and she begins her hunt for the bugs and beetles, frogs and mice she likes so well to eat. Now there was a certain old owl who had become very cross and hard to please as she grew older, especially if anything disturbed her daily slumbers. One warm summer afternoon, as she dozed away in her den in the old oak tree, a grasshopper nearby began a joyous but very raspy song. Out popped the old owl's head from the opening in the tree that served her both for door and for window. Get away from here, sir, she said to the grasshopper. Have you no manners? You should at least respect my age and leave me to sleep in quiet. But the grasshopper answered saucily that he had as much right to his place in the sun as the owl had to her place in the old oak. Then he struck up a louder and still more rasping tune. The wise old owl knew quite well that it would do no good to argue with the grasshopper, nor with anybody else for that matter. Besides, her eyes were not sharp enough by day to permit her to punish the grasshopper as he deserved. So she laid aside all hard words and spoke very kindly to him. Well, sir, she said, if I must stay awake, I am going to settle right down to enjoy your singing. Now that I think of it, I have a wonderful wine here, sent me from Olympus, of which I am told Apollo drinks before he sings to the high gods. Please come up and taste this delicious drink with me. I know it will make you sing like Apollo himself. The foolish grasshopper was taken in by the owl's flattering words. Up he jumped to the owl's den. But as soon as he was near enough so the old owl could see him clearly, she pounced upon him and ate him up. Moral Flattery is not a proof of true admiration. 
Do not let flattery throw you off of your guard against an enemy. The Oak and the Reeds A giant oak stood near a brook in which grew some slender reeds. When the wind blew, the great oak stood proudly, upright, with its hundred arms uplifted to the sky. But the reeds bowed low in the wind and sang a sad and mournful song. You have reason to complain, said the oak. The slightest breeze that ruffles the surface of the water makes you bow your heads, while I, the mighty oak, stand upright and firm before the howling tempest. Do not worry about us, replied the reeds. The winds do not harm us. We bow before them, and so we do not break. You, in all your pride and strength, have so far resisted their blows. But the end is coming. As the reeds spoke, a great hurricane rushed out of the north. The oak stood proudly and fought against the storm while the yielding reeds bowed low. The wind redoubled in fury, and all at once the great tree fell, torn up by the roots, and lay among the pitying reeds. Moral. Better to yield when it is folly to resist, than to resist stubbornly and be destroyed. The Two Goats Two goats frisking gaily on the rocky steeps of a mountain valley chanced to meet, one on each side of a deep chasm through which poured a mighty mountain torrent. The trunk of a fallen tree formed the only means of crossing the chasm, and on this not even two squirrels could have passed each other in safety. The narrow path would have made the bravest tremble. Not so are goats. Their pride would not permit either to stand aside for the other. One set her foot on the log, the other did likewise. In the middle they met horn to horn, neither would give way, and so they both fell to be swept away by the roaring torrent below. Moral It is better to yield than to come to misfortune through stubbornness. The Wild Boar and the Fox A wild boar was sharpening his tusk busily against the stump of a tree, when a fox happened by. Now the fox was always looking for a chance to make fun of his neighbors, so he made a great show of looking anxiously about, as if in fear of some hidden enemy, but the boar kept right on with his work. Why are you doing that? asked the fox at last with a grin. There isn't any danger that I can see. True enough, replied the boar, but when danger does come there, will not be time for such work as this. My weapons will have to be ready for use then, or I shall suffer for it. Moral. Preparedness for war is the best guarantee of peace. The Heron. Heron was walking sedately along the bank of a stream, his eyes on the clear water and his long neck and pointed bill ready to snap up a likely morsel for his breakfast. The clear water swarmed with fish, but Master Heron was hard to please that morning. No small fry for me, he said. Such scanty fare is not fit for a heron. Now a fine young perch swam near. No, indeed, said the heron. I wouldn't even trouble to open my beak for anything like that. As the sun rose, the fish left the shallow water near the shore and swam below into the cool depths toward the middle. The heron saw no more fish, and very glad was he at last to breakfast on a tiny snail. Moral do not be too hard to suit, or you may have to be content with the worst or with nothing at all. The Fox and the Stork The fox one day thought of a plan to amuse himself at the expense of the stork. 
at whose odd appearance he was always laughing. You must come and dine with me today, he said to the stork, smiling to himself at the trick he was going to play. The stork gladly accepted the invitation and arrived in good time and with a very good appetite. For dinner the fox served soup, but it was set out in a very shallow dish, and all the stork could do was to wet the very tip of his bill. Not a drop of soup could he get, but the fox lapped it up easily, and to increase the disappointment of the stork made a great show of enjoyment. The hungry stork was much displeased at the trick, but he was a calm, even-tempered fellow and saw no good in flying into a rage. Instead, not long afterward, he invited the fox to dine with him in turn. The fox arrived promptly at the time that had been set, and the stork served a fish dinner that had a very appetizing smell. But it was served in a tall jar with a very narrow neck. The stork could easily get at the food with his long bill, but all the fox could do was to lick the outside of the jar and sniff at the delicious odor. And when the fox lost his temper, the stork said calmly, Moral, do not play tricks on your neighbors unless you can stand the same treatment yourself. The Rooster and the Fox One bright evening, as the sun was sinking on a glorious world, a wise old rooster flew into a tree to roost. Before he composed himself to rest, he flapped his wings three times and crowed loudly. But just as he was about to put his head under his wing, his beady eyes caught a flash of red and a glimpse of a long pointed nose, and there, just below him, stood Master Fox. "'Have you heard the wonderful news?' cried the fox in a very joyful and excited manner. "'What news?' asked the rooster very calmly. But he had a queer, fluttery feeling inside him, for, you know, he was very much afraid of the fox. "'Your family, and mine, and all other animals, have agreed to forget their differences and live in peace,' and friendship from now on forever. Just think of it. I simply cannot wait to embrace you. Do come down, dear friend, and let us celebrate the joyful event. How grand, said the rooster. I certainly am delighted at the news. But, he spoke in an absent way, and stretching up on tiptoes, seemed to be looking at something afar off. "'What is it you see?' asked the fox a little anxiously. "'Why, it looks to me like a couple of dogs coming this way. "'They must have heard the good news, and—' "'But the fox did not wait to hear more. "'Off he started on a run. "'Wait!' cried the rooster. "'Why do you run? "'The dogs are friends of yours now.' "'Yes,' answered the fox, "'but they might not have heard the news.' Besides, I have a very important errand that I had almost forgotten about. The rooster smiled as he buried his head in his feathers and went to sleep, for he had succeeded in outwitting a very crafty enemy. Moral The trickster is easily tricked. The Fox and the Goat a fox fell into a well, and though it was not very deep, he found that he could not get out again. After he had been in the well a long time, a thirsty goat came by. The goat thought the fox had gone down to drink, and so he asked if the water was good. The finest in the whole country, said the crafty fox. Jump in and dry it. There is more than enough for both of us. The thirsty goat immediately jumped in and began to drink. The fox just as quickly jumped on the goat's back and leaped from the tip of the goat's horn out of the well. The foolish goat now saw what a plight he had gotten into and begged the fox to help him out. But the fox was already on his way to the woods. 
If you had as much sense as you have beard, old fellow, he said as he ran, you would have been more cautious about finding a way to get out again before you jumped in. Moral. Look before you leap. The Fox and the Leopard A fox and a leopard, resting lazily after a generous dinner, amused themselves by disputing about their good looks. The leopard was very proud of his glossy, spotted coat and made disdainful remarks about the fox, whose appearance he declared was quite ordinary. The fox prided himself on his fine bushy tail with its tip of white, but he was wise enough to see that he could not rival the leopard in looks. Still he kept a flow of sarcastic talk just to exercise his wits and to have the fun of disputing. The leopard was about to lose his temper when the fox got up yawning lazily. You may have a very smart coat, he said but you would be a great deal better off if you had a little more smartness inside your head and less on your ribs. The way I am, that's what I call real beauty. Moral. A fine coat is not always an indication of an attractive mind. The Wolf in Sheep's Clothing a certain wolf could not get enough to eat because of the watchfulness of the shepherds. But one night he found a sheepskin that had been cast aside and forgotten. The next day, dressed in the skin, the wolf strolled into the pasture with the sheep. Soon a little lamb was following him about and was quickly led away to slaughter. That evening the wolf entered the fold with the flock but it happened that the shepherd took a fancy for mutton broth that very evening, and picking up a knife, went to the fold. There the first he laid hands on and killed was the wolf. Moral. The evil doer often comes to harm through his own deceit. The Eagle and the Beetle a beetle once begged the eagle to spare a hare which had run to her for protection, but the eagle pounced upon her prey. The sweep of her great wings tumbling, the beetle a dozen feet away. Furious at the disrespect shown her, the beetle flew to the eagle's nest and rolled out the eggs. Not one did she spare. The eagle's grief and anger knew no bounds, but who had done the cruel deed she did not know. Next year, the eagle built her nest far up on a mountain crag, but the beetle found it and again destroyed the eggs. In despair, the eagle now implored great Jupiter to let her place her eggs in his lap. There, none would dare harm them, but the beetle buzzed about Jupiter's head, made him rise to drive her away, and the eggs rolled from his lap. Now the beetle told the reason for her action, and Jupiter had to acknowledge the justice of her cause. And they say that ever after, while the eagle's eggs lie in the nest in spring, the beetle still sleeps in the ground, for so Jupiter commanded. Moral. Even the weakest may find means to avenge a wrong. The Mother and the Wolf Early one morning, a hungry wolf was prowling around a cottage at the edge of a village when he heard a child crying in the house. Then he heard the mother's voice say, Hush, child, hush. Stop your crying or I will give you to the wolf. Surprised but delighted at the prospect of so delicious a meal, the wolf settled down under an open window, expecting every moment to have the child handed out to him. But though the little one continued to fret, the wolf waited all day in vain. Then, toward nightfall, he heard the mother's voice again as she sat down near the window to sing and rock her baby to sleep. There, child, there. The wolf shall not get you. No, no. Daddy is watching, and Daddy will kill him if he should come near. Just then the father came within sight of the home, and the wolf was barely able to save himself from the dog's by a clever bit of running. 
Moral, do not believe everything you hear. The Ant and the Dove A dove saw an ant fall into a brook. The ant struggled in vain to reach the bank, and in pity, the dove dropped a blade of straw close beside it. Clinging to the straw like a shipwrecked sailor to a broken spar, the ant floated safely to shore. Soon after, the ant saw a man getting ready to kill the dove with a stone, but just as he cast the stone, the ant stung him in the heel, so that the pain made him miss his aim, and the startled dove flew to safety in a distant wood. Moral. A kindness is never wasted. The Man and the Satyr A long time ago, a man met a satyr in the forest and succeeded in making friends with him. The two soon became the best of comrades, living together in the man's hut. But one cold winter evening, as they were walking homeward, the satyr saw the man blow on his fingers. Why do you do that? asked the satyr. To warm my hands, the man replied. When they reached home, the man prepared two bowls of porridge. These he placed steaming hot on the table, and the comrades sat down very cheerfully to enjoy the meal. But much to the satyr's surprise, the man began to blow into his bowl of porridge. Why do you do that? he asked. To cool my porridge, replied the man. The satyr sprang hurriedly to his feet and made for the door. Goodbye, he said. I've seen enough. A fellow that blows hot and cold in the same breath cannot be friends with me. Moral. The man who talks for both sides is not to be trusted by either. The Hare and His Ears The lion had been badly hurt by the horns of a goat, which he was eating. He was very angry to think that any animal that he chose for a meal should be so brazen as to wear such dangerous things as horns to scratch him while he ate. So he commanded that all animals with horns should leave his domains within twenty-four hours. The command struck terror among the beasts. All those who were so unfortunate as to have horns began to pack up and move out, even the hare who, as you know, has no horns, and so had nothing to fear. Passed a very restless night, dreaming awful dreams about the fearful lion. And when he came out of the warren in the early morning sunshine, and there saw the shadow cast by his long and pointed ears, a terrible fright seized him. Goodbye, neighbor cricket, he called. I'm off. He will certainly make out that my ears are horns, no matter what I say. Moral Do not give your enemies the slightest reason to attack your reputation. Your enemies will seize any excuse to attack you. The Wolf and the Kid There was once a little kid whose growing horns made him think he was a grown-up billy goat and able to take care of himself. So one evening, when the flock started home from the pasture and his mother called, the kid paid no heed and kept right on nibbling the tender grass. A little later, when he lifted his head, the flock was gone. He was all alone. The sun was sinking, long shadows came creeping over the ground, a chilly little wind came creeping with them making scary noises in the grass. The kid shivered as he thought of the terrible wolf. Then he started wildly over the field, bleeding for his mother, but not halfway near a clump of trees, there was the wolf. The kid knew there was little hope for him. Please, Mr. Wolf, he said, trembling. I know you are going to eat me, but first please pipe me a tune for I want to dance and be merry as long as I can. The wolf liked the idea of a little music before eating, so he struck up a merry tune, and the kid leaped and frisked gaily. Meanwhile, the flock was moving slowly homeward. In the still evening air, the wolf's piping carried far. 
The shepherd dogs pricked up their ears. They recognized the song the wolf sings before a feast, and in a moment they were racing back to the pasture. The wolf's song ended suddenly, and as he ran with the dogs at his heels, he called himself a fool for turning piper to please a kid, when he should have stuck to his butcher's trade. Moral do not let anything turn you from your purpose. The Tortoise and the Ducks The tortoise, you know, carries his house on his back. No matter how hard he tries, he cannot leave home. They say that Jupiter punished him so because he was such a lazy stay-at-home that he would not go to Jupiter's wedding, even when especially invited. After many years, Tortoise began to wish he had gone to that wedding. When he saw how gaily the birds flew about and how the hare and the chipmunk and all the other animals ran nimbly by, always eager to see everything there was to be seen. The Tortoise felt very sad and discontented. He wanted to see the world too, and there he was with a house on his back and little short legs that could hardly drag him along. One day he met a pair of ducks and told them all his trouble. We can help you to see the world, said the ducks. Take hold of this stick with your teeth and we will carry you far up in the air where you can see the whole countryside, but keep quiet or you will be sorry. The tortoise was very glad indeed. He seized the stick firmly with his teeth. The two ducks told him to hold on tight at each end, and away they sailed up toward the clouds. Just then, a crow flew by. He was very much astonished at the strange sight and cried, This must surely be the king of tortoises. Why, certainly, began the tortoise, but as he opened his mouth to say these foolish words, he lost his hold on the stick, and down he fell to the ground, where he was dashed to pieces on a rock. Moral Foolish curiosity and vanity often lead to misfortune. The Young Crab and His Mother Why in the world do you walk sideways like that? said a mother crab to her son. You should always walk straight forward with your toes turned out. Show me how to walk, mother dear, answered the little crab obediently. I want to learn. So the old crab tried and tried to walk straight forward, but she could walk sideways only, like her son. And when she wanted to turn her toes out, she tripped and fell on her nose. Moral do not tell others how to act unless you can set a good example. <laughs>